Okay, so welcome to Innovate DC. Um, right here with this one moment. Sorry about that. Um, the joys of working from home. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll start again. <laughs> uh, welcome to Innovate DC. We're here um, with Norma Lally and Jesse James. <laughs> I'll just pass it off to you to the participant. Uh, sorry. No problem. Thank you, Elsie. Um, I totally understand. I've I've been in that exact position myself before. So I'm sure all of us have experienced something to that degree in the last two years. So. Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. I anticipate there might be a few more that, that trickle in um, as, we, as we kind of do our introduction here. My name is Norm Lavalley, as, as Elsie mentioned. I am an economist and uh, an instructor and uh, curriculum developer with the Tula Center of Indigenous, Indigenous Economics. Um, I'm joined by a lovely and capable team of um, Tulo Center members here. I'll, I'll let them kind of jump on and introduce themselves here as well. And I also see a lot of familiar faces and names here. So it's it's nice to uh, welcome you all here today. So I'll kind of pass it off to our uh, Tulo Center um, team here and they can say hello and, and introduce themselves. So starting here with, uh, I have Chelsea here on my on my screen. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chelsea. I'm the newest member of the Tulo Center. Happy to be here today. Um, I'll be watching the chat. So any messages or questions you have, you can either put them in the chat or email me at info at tulo.ca. All right, uh, Lindsay. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Risling. I am the uh, one of the program coordinators for the Tulo Center and I will be sharing the presentation today. Um, Andrea. Hi everyone. I also see some familiar faces, so it's good to see you all. Um, I'm Andrea Phillips and I am the program coordinator for the LANS program and I also help out with communications. I'm just here to assist and if you guys have any questions, you can email me andrea at tulo.ca. And uh, co-host here, Jesse James. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, they're doing some filming and I think there's a truck outside, so hopefully you can hear me all right. It's, it's nice to see some familiar faces and some names like, uh, you know, we just went through that. Uh, I'm, I work for the First Nations Tax Commission. I'm the regional outreach manager. And I also get to uh, work with the, this great team at the Tula Center. Yeah, I'll be presenting near the end of this uh, slide, slide deck. I think I got about eight slides or so. And I see that there's another member that might have slipped in as a registrant, um, oh, Julie Holloway. Say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Holloway. I'm a communications advisor here at Tulo, and it's nice to see you. OK, and I see that we're, we're starting to, to gain some participants here. Um, it would be really nice to go through um, all the participants just say hello, kind of where you're from. And um, I, this, this workshop, this webinar is going to rely on your active participation. We're going to play a fun game. Um, we hope that there's some debate, some discussion, some active learning. So I'd really like to hear from you if, if at all possible. Um, you know, just state your name, where you're from, and uh, you know, what organization you're with. I will um, maybe call people out if that works the best. Um, how about uh, Dolly? Um, yes, good afternoon, Dolly Kershaw, um, Williams Lake, and I work for the Silco Tea National Government. Nice to meet you, Dolly. Thank you. Welcome. Patricia? Hi, I'm Patricia Crow. I'm currently located in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, and wow. I work, yes, everybody's like, hmm, PA. <laughs> <laughs> Google it. It exists. <laughs> Anyways, um, I work with Morris Interactive as a senior consultant, but I also am a board member for the Saskatchewan Indigenous Economic Development Network here in Saskatchewan, and I sit on a seat of board, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Fantastic. Welcome, Patricia. Uh, Paul, Donald. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Donald. I'm uh, from Kamloops. I work uh, out in uh, my community at the Simp First Nation for the Simp Resources Group, where I'm the Director of Business Development. And I know lots of people on the call already. So hi, everyone. Fantastic, Paul. Hop, skip and a jump from us. I'm, I'm in Kamloops. We're all in Kamloops. Um, Sandy Mitchell, if you can say hello. Some people have their screens off and maybe they might be listening to other things. So that's okay. I'm going to give you a minute and then I'll, I'll, I'll move along. Tina, Tina Rasmussen. Afternoon. I'm Tina Rasmussen. Hi. I'm corporate development officer with Meadow Lake Tribal Council up in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Fantastic. Welcome. Some, Saska Hi, Patricia. some uh, Saskatchewan representation here today. Oh, it looks like Sandy might might be on. Maybe uh, Svetlana looks like uh, you're from from Kandu. Welcome. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, Asad Nayani. Hi, everyone. My name is Asad, and I am based in Vancouver, uh, BC, and I work at a a uh, management firm called ZN Advisory that works for First Nation communities. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. Fantastic, welcome Asad. Um, Tracy, a Tulo student. Hi everyone, Tracy LaFond from White Cap Dakota First Nation in Saskatchewan. Um, happy awesome. to be here, nice to see you guys. Well represented, <laughs> Central Canada well represented. Uh, Tabitha. Hi, Tabitha. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tabitha Enius, and I am from Penticton Indian Band. I'm currently working as the housing manager and really looking forward to this as we know housing is dependent on many different things in our communities and economic development being one of them. Um, I also sit on the board of the First Nation um, housing Professional Association. So um, this will provide some really good information as well um, for that. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I hope so. Thank you so much, Tabitha. Um, we have Kaylee Gardner. Say a few words about yourself if you can hear us. If not, nope, left. Kim Guerin. Hi, Kim Guerin. Sorry. No Keep problem. Masquam Indian Reserve, Indian Band, and uh, I work in lands governance. I regret I have to step away to an uh, unexpected appointment, but um, I'm, I was looking forward to the session, and, and I see we're recording. So yes. to follow up, please uh, accept my regrets. No problem. Thanks for uh, showing up for a little bit, and uh, we That's will be recording. So. Hi, Kim. Uh, Jason Alexis, who just joined us. Your name and uh, where are you from and, and what organization you're with? Hello, my name is Jason Alexis. I'm the Economic Development Manager for Psychos First Nation. Fantastic. Nice to meet you, Jason. And uh, Ken, I think last but not least. Yes, hey, Ken. Um, I'm with uh, Canada Post. Uh, my job is to recruit Indigenous uh, transportation contractors for all across Canada. Fantastic. Welcome, Ken. I hear you are a regular in these sessions. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm glad we got to um, introduce each other and, and kind of see each other's faces and hear each other's voices. Um, as I mentioned, this will kind of involve your active participation. So I'm really glad we were able to connect in this um, sometimes uh, difficult to connect environment. Okay, so I'm going to go through a little bit about um, the Tulo Center and about some of the concepts that are um, under that underpin the game that we're going to play today. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm an economist. I've been um, a researcher and analyst uh, with a company called Fiscal Realities for about 15 years, and I've also worked with the Tulo Center since its inception. And um, the Tulo Center is a is a charitable organization 
that is all about uh, building innovations, sharing knowledge, and education and training. Okay, so I've been working with the Tulo Center, um, you know, since its inception. And um, what we, you know, what we focus on really is about uh, research, um, about jurisdictional development for um, Indigenous communities, and then um, providing education and training based on um, expanding jurisdiction for communities and First Nations organizations. So let's just kind of skip to the first slide there, Lindsay. Right, so we're committed to sharing innovations and strategies that renew Indigenous economies and strengthen Indigenous capacity to Im implement institutional frameworks that enable economies to thrive. That is a lot. Those are a lot of words um, coming at you that, you know, you may or may not, um, you know, understand the definition or you've heard the words, but you're not, you're not quite sure what they mean. Well, we'll go through some of this stuff, but really the underpinning of um, what we do at Tulo is we're all about strategies and innovations in order to expand jurisdiction for Indigenous communities. Um, and the way by which we do a lot of that jurisdiction exp jurisdictional ex expansion is really in regards to economic development. Okay, so we'll go with the next slide. Here are really our four premises and our strategy of the Tulo Center. For those of you who may not, you know, be completely familiar with what we do, um, we our first premise is that all First Nations are interested in renewing jurisdictions which were destroyed or dismantled by colonization. Okay, so renewing jurisdictions in a way that is culturally and economically relevant and appropriate. Okay, so the second premise is that some First Nations are interested in renewing their jurisdictions in a manner that supports economic growth. And that's really our bailiwick is economics, taxation, um, fiscal and expenditure aspects of government and public sector innovation, which I'm going to touch on as we go through this, this presentation and, and hopefully as we see in the game. Um, number three, effective economic strategies. We are always focusing on them being practical and generating benefits to members, raising standards of living and improving services and infrastructure. So it's all about raising um, living standards, um, all about ensuring that these are practical solutions that can be implemented in a way um, that, you know, sometimes capacity can be an issue. So it's all about ensuring these things are practical and that costs are reduced, transaction costs, switching costs, which are two concepts I'm going to talk about, are reduced as much as possible so um, that jurisdictions can be expanded as quickly as possible so that economic development projects can, can move forward. Number four, and this is kind of our philosophy when we're in the classroom, um, we believe and we've observed that learning occurs much faster from each other. When we share knowledge, um, when we work together on practical problems, um, when you know individuals from right across Canada like today can come together and we can share what we've learned, maybe some of the challenges we've had, some of the successes we've had, some of the strategies we might have undertaken or heard or um, anything like that. But it, it, we find that it, it, things occur faster, learning occurs faster, changes occur faster and can be applied much more quickly when um, we're able to share that knowledge and work together, okay? So our strategy really in the end is to support and share jurisdictional and administrative innovations so things that are new, especially from the public sector perspective, because a lot of us kind of put that public sector hat on, especially in our communities, um, that creatively destroy the colonial system, right? A system that was imposed that um, kind of destroyed the underlying uh, First Nation uh, jurisdictional framework um, with interested First Nations and Indigenous groups around the world. So we've worked with in Indigenous groups in New Zealand, um, indigenous groups in the U.S., Australia, um, even a little bit with the indigenous groups in Taiwan, and um, really, there's there's a lot of common elements. There are some differences, but there are a lot of common elements, and there's a, a great opportunity we've found to share knowledge even across borders um, like that. So, next slide. 
Um, shameless plug, <laughs> the Chulo Center is, um, we're accepting applications if anyone's interested um, to both our tax administration and land management programs for the upcoming, um, the upcoming cohort. As Chelsea had mentioned, you can get a hold of her at info at tulo.ca. For right now, we provide three certificate programs um, in conjunction with uh, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. We do a blend of um, in-person and online um, programming. And typically our programs are about a year um, and our tax administration program is pretty consistent, eight courses throughout the year, and um, you get a certificate in, in First Nations Tax Administration. And our uh, Applied Economics program is our third one, along with our Lands Management program. And the Lands Management program is very similar to the Tax Administration program. It's, it's courses throughout a whole year. The Applied Economics program is kind of on demand as students want to uh, learn a little bit more about Applied Economics um, in regards to Indigenous communities. Okay, so um, we're always looking to expand our programs and we are looking at expanding in areas of infrastructure, um, financial management, um, as well as some MBA courses that we're working on with Thompson Rivers University. Okay, next slide. Okay, so a lot of um, sort of the, the backbone of what we look at at the Tulo Center is what's called economic decolonization. So as I alluded to, and as I kind of mentioned a few times over those last couple of slides, um, the colonial governance framework came in and dismantled the indigenous government framework. So what we're looking at is an effective way to replace that colonial governance framework. And how do we go about doing that? That is always the question that we're asking at the Tulo Center. How do we switch from one system to another? That's really where a lot of our background is, is understanding comparative systems. So how do we switch from the colonial governance framework to one that is um, indigenous um, jurisdictional framework, okay? Uh, we always attack these problems from the side of developing economies, the foundations of an economy. So what are the foundations of an economy? We're gonna talk a little bit about that. The game is gonna really be about that. So we try to look at the ways and the strategies by which to build a sustainable and resilient economy that supports indigenous economic, cultural and jurisdictional growth. So it doesn't compromise on culture, um, doesn't compromise on jurisdiction, okay? And really, we've had a very good example of whether economies are sustainable or resilient over the last two years with the pandemic. Um, sustainability is your ability to withstand a pot potential economic shock or an economic shock that is at your front door, like a pandemic. How well are governments able to withstand and economies are able to withstand a shock like this with lockdowns and supply chain disruptions and uh, disruptions to the business environment? How well does an economy keep moving forward? And then how resilient are you afterwards? If you had some parts of your economy severely disrupted, how quick and how flexible is an economy to be able to pick up the pieces, adapt and move forward um, in the form of you know, continued sustainability? So we're gonna test how well um, you, you're able to build an economy that's both sustainable and resilient to an economic shock. That's precisely what we're doing here. But I'm gonna give you a little bit more background before um, we go into it. And really our, our um, philosophy around this is creative decolonization, accomplishing decolonization through public sector innovations. We always talk about private sector innovations, You know, the, the latest iPhone, we're on Zoom right now. All the applications that Zoom is working on to, you know, further um, entrench Zoom into our, you know, our, our work life, um, all the things that Microsoft does. But we never talk about how the public sector or governments, um, particularly, you know, local governments, indigenous governments, keep up with that change and and innovate themselves. That's. So what we're going to talk about today, and that's really what we focus on at the Tulo Center. 
Okay, next slide. <laughs> On your team, yes. Oh, I'll be able to jump into your groups, don't worry. Um, okay, I've, uh, we've got a little video here that our director, Andre Ledresse, um, has recorded, and it's a, a little bit of a background about how economies grow, and um, hopefully you can um, see a, li a little bit of it uh, when, you're, when you play your game. Take it away. The bane of all our existence is the circle. There we go. Have you ever wondered how this happened in some First Nations? Here is Park Royal in Squamish Nation. Here are residential developments in Chiacton, Tecumloops, and West Bay. Here is a golf course and casino development in Whitecap, Dakota. You may be surprised to know that this is the same phenomena that leads to cities. In 1903, Vancouver looked like this. Now, it looks like this. Christchurch went from this to this. In just 26 years, central Shanghai went from an empty field to a sprawling metropolis. All of this begins from the same source, ideas. Somebody looks at these places, sees their advantage or an opportunity to make a profit, and they make an investment, or in truth, a bet, that they can sell something from that area to someone outside of that area. If the investment, or bet, is a good one, it causes exports to rise. In some cases, exports are goods like seafood or resources. In some cases, exports are services like tourism, restaurants, and retail spaces. Or they can be spaces to build a house, live, and do business. These are the beginnings of the cycle of growth that builds First Nation economies. And it goes like this. Investment is intended to realize a local advantage. If it is successful, it will lead to exports and revenue growth, which is the financial benefit for recognizing the opportunity and taking on the risk of the investment. Revenue growth creates jobs and the demand for employment. The employment demand leads to the need for housing for the labor force, which creates housing demand. In order for there to be adequate housing and services, this housing demand leads to the demand for infrastructure and public services. This includes things like roads, water, sewer, telecommunications, health and education. The income and the goods and services demanded by the labor force and their families will lead to greater government revenues if the government has and exercises fiscal power. If fiscal power isn't present, this is the point the cycle breaks down. The presence of fiscal power allows governments to expand infrastructure and services for the economy, which attracts more investors and entrepreneurs and allows the investment cycle to start again. Eventually, that one idea leads to a city built on many ideas. And what does an economy need to make this happen? There are two keys. A strong, reliable investment climate with certainty and low startup costs and fiscal powers to generate revenues and build infrastructure and services. As you can see, cities start in our imagination, but then require the practical work of people, businesses, and government to ensure growth. Okay, so in that short video, um, it, really the takeaway that we we kind of want you to have is that uh, an economy only functions so well um or as well as if they can put ideas into reality how well can economy facilitate an idea into um something that's real something that's tangible uh like economic development okay so uh, the you know, how strong an economy is really relates to how well that process can happen. And our director, uh, Dr. Andre Ledresse, he 
um, he was a narrator in that video. He always says when he puts this slide up, this is um, really everything we know about economics in one slide. So there you go. You have the whole, here's the whole thing. We may as well just maybe just all leave right now. I'm just kidding. Um, it, it, really, um, it, it is, it, it does it kind of in a very simplistic way, go through all of the aspects of an economy um, from sort of a high level. So really you start with a comparative advantage or what's sort of happening in um, a region or in a local government. It can even be a, you know, a state, a province, a nation, um, a continent. What are the comparative advantages in the area? Every economy can't, it, some people say we don't have any of those. Every economy has at least some comparative advantage. So it all starts with at least one of the comparative advantages. They can be anything from, you know, proximity to markets, how close you are, your geography, um, to emerging technology, uh, tourism features, labor supply, uh, commercial activity, uh, mineral rights, and there is a whole host of others, environmental. Um, so it always starts with a comparative advantage. And then in order to make you know, turn ideas into something tangible and something real, it requires the foundation of an economy. And these are the things that we kind of take for granted. And the public sector sets up for us to be able to realize our opportunities in our comparative advantages. And um, these are what we call the public institutions. So it requires at least, an economy requires at least one comparative advantage, but it requires all of the public institutions. Um, these are things like secure property rights, um, ensuring, you know, your your leases are able to be facilitated quickly, um, you know, whether there's, um, you know, oversight over those leases, whether, you know, you're able to extend possible the, the term, um, that all has to be um, clear, that all has to be laid out. Supportive legal framework is a legal framework a hindrance to economic development or does it support and facilitate and protect um, in regards to economic development? Does it protect culture? Does it um, work with the economy in order to be able to um, facilitate economic development in a way that is in alignment with the community priorities, right? So um, that's a significant one. Governance, leadership, and administration um, is the leadership, is it a priority for economic development? Um, is there information available for individuals who have an idea and would like to invest in an economy? Um, what's the capacity like in a community? Is there institutional support uh, for that capacity from organizations, um, you know, First Nation organizations, First Nation institutions? How's the fiscal relationship? So with a fiscal relationship, we're, uh, we're sort of referring to um, the mix of fiscal jurisdiction, which is the level of taxation, um, how maybe transfers work with federal government or other governments, and then how are those monies utilized to provide services in the community? And then lastly, infrastructure. Infrastructure is incredibly important, as many of you probably know, in regards to ensuring that a project can maybe move forward or not. Um, so all of these things, lead to the realization of comparative advantages or the idea. And depending on how strong or how clear or how well set, set up they are, can lead to sustainability or competitive advantage for investment and innovation over the long term. Okay, so this philosophy underpins everything we do at the Tulo Center, um, all the strategies and innovations that we come up with, um, as well as the game itself, this is underpinning that game. So keep that in mind. It might be a little bit of a key while you're while you're playing. Next slide. Um, as you know, a lot of our previous experience, and as we might all know, First Nation public institutions to support economic development as a result of colonization, um, there's some assembly required. I don't know if you're able to put together your iPhone, but I certainly wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but sometimes, you know, we, we look at indigenous ec economies and um, there's a lot of work. There's some assembly that we have to put together. Some things are disparate. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the uh, Indian Act, the presence of the Indian Act and the dismantling of indigenous institutions um, as a result of colonization. Next slide. 
And the result are some systemic gaps that we've estimated at the Tulo Center. I'm not gonna go through every single one. You probably have this, um, but we've estimated some fairly significant gaps. And these are the gaps that we are trying to, um, with our strategies, with this philosophy, um, and of course, all of you are trying to um, close over time, significant infrastructure gap, um, fiscal gap, proportionally, First Nations don't have their fair share of um, the tax revenues. Uh, there's a significant credit gap. It's incredibly difficult to access capital on the capital markets, um, to borrow, to start a business, to borrow, to, um, to invest in property. Uh, STEAM education, we had another E for economics, but that's science, technology, engineering, economics, and math. There's a significant gap or underrepresentation of indigenous peoples in these uh, jobs, in this labor market. Investment facilitation, it's four to six times higher for um, a project to go forward on indigenous lands versus off indigenous lands. And trade exports, there's about a $12.5 billion gap in regards to exports um, from indigenous communities to off. Okay, next slide. And this is our algorithm for change. Um, you know, oftentimes we see these gaps, we talk about them all the time, they've been present for years, um, but why doesn't anything change, right? Um, it's all about what's called switching costs, right? The switch from one system to another, it has to be facilitated in a way to lower the cost. If, you, if I said to you, okay, tomorrow, if you have an iPhone, you're gonna be using an Android phone. The switching costs would be high in regards to your time. You have to buy a new Android phone. You have to, you, the cost of actually setting it up is gonna be high and your time and effort to learn that system is gonna be high. Very similar to this situation. It's difficult to go from one system to another, but how do we facilitate that system as best as we can so that it's optional, so that um, you know, individuals feel as though there is an opportunity on the other side to do it in a way that is not as painful. So a lot of the causes that you know, require change, we see legal, political, um, it could be fiscal, which we're experiencing right now is significant um, uh, budget deficits with government. We're gonna be experiencing some significant fiscal realities coming up. Um, technological changes, de demographic shifts, environment, um, many causes for change, but how do we go about doing the change? Well, it requires ideas, it requires some research, plans, and then you evaluate, okay? So how are the transaction costs? Does it raise transaction costs? If it raises transaction costs in an economy, it'll be very difficult to implement change because the incentives won't be there for change to occur. Does it increase switching costs? If it increased switching costs, take up of an idea or of a system change is gonna be very difficult. Um, people won't you know, see the benefit in it, especially if you think about, you know, you go from iPhone to Android or vice versa. That's, I mean, a, a micro aspect of that. Um, could you just imagine when you're thinking about, you know, going from a colonial governance framework to a jurisdictional framework, how do we reduce the switching costs from moving from one system to another? Um, they can be fairly, fairly significant. So we really focus on the strategies by which that movement from one system to another is a lot smoother and with lower costs. Then you have outputs. How do you, you know, embed that in legislation? How do you develop the institutional framework to support that switching or the lowering of transaction costs that results in, you know, indigenous institutions um, to support capacity development? Um, to provide you know, standards, to provide samples, templates, to be able to move from one system to another. And it requires legislation to ensure that there's permanence of the changes. And then there's implementation, which you know, the standards and templates help with. And then there's education and training that you can provide so that the switching costs are continually lowered and individuals are able to hopefully learn about the new system and Kind of take it to the to the point that aligns with their priorities. Okay, next slide. So I come back to this picture, and that's really what we focus on: transaction costs and switching costs in regards to setting up an economy. Next slide. 
And our best example of this is the development of the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. Um, it was really set up with the idea in mind that to reduce the switching costs, moving from um, a colonial governance framework where jurisdiction was with um, governments, federal government, and moving that to a system where there is First Nations jurisdiction through legislation, through more fiscal power or taxation jurisdiction. And what we've seen is some fairly significant growth from zero to over 313 years. This is an optional piece of legislation. Um, and Jesse's gonna speak a lot more about this when, when he uh, talks about the FNTC, but we've seen some fairly significant growth in this innovation um, for uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities. Next slide. Some of the observations and some of the successes from moving from the system to uh, from the colonial system to this system increased private investment over two billion dollars since its inception over 800 million in, in fiscal revenue has been the result which is that fiscal relationship piece that i talked about almost 1500 tax fiscal and financial laws passed double a rating for the fnfa um, which is the um, lending authority under the fma and over 1 billion in financing for uh, Indigenous projects, 22 original accredited courses and over 200 students. That's where, where we come in, where the educational aspect of, of the FMA and then financial management capacity, over 100 certified First Nations in um, financial management uh, certification. Next slide. And how it happens, how it reduces switching costs, well, it's optional um, uh, and it's designed to respect and support the right of self-determination. It creates a legal and administrative framework, right? If we think about the bottom part of that equation, it's really doing those things. And it's also going through that process map that we showed. Um, is the legal administrative framework designed by First Nations? And does it allow First Nations to um, to move from ideas to reality? Um, does it also allow for the reduction of transaction costs to make efficient um, economic exchange in, a, in an economy? And also, does it support a higher credit rating for access to the capital markets? Institutional framework, well, um, the FMA created three fiscal institutions, the First Nations um, Tax Commission, the First Nations Fiscal uh, Financial Management Board and the First Nations Finance Authority. It creates jurisdictional permanence because it's a piece of legislation. We provide capacity development and accredited training through TULO and um, First Nations institutions, which are there to innovate and lower transaction costs and switching costs and also provide capacity support. Next slide. Okay, game time. So where I think we're right on track here. I will go through a little bit about the game. That's kind of the background of what you're gonna be experiencing and sort of maybe the mindset you wanna have when you go into the game. Um, I'll put the game link in the chat for everyone. So it's app, oh, hello? Oh, here we go. I can't type for some reason, so someone else might be might have to do it. There it is. Thank you, Chelsea. For some reason, I kept locking up when I would try to type, so I better not. So that's the link. I'm going to go through a little bit of the gameplay, and then you can you can play it yourself. We'll give you plenty of time for you to discuss your strategies and and what you're going to want to do. Well, let's go to the next slide. The objective is to make a series of strategic decisions um, to create an indigenous economy that's both sustainable and resilient. I referred to that before. So sustainable, able to withstand a shock, resilience, how do you come out of a shock? So you're going to make your choices and then you're going to find out, you know, how, how well your economy was able to withstand the shock. Um, we call those, you know, external shocks or economic shocks. It's typically an external event. That happens. Some people call them black swan events. Um, so it's something that it's unforeseen that happens to your economy. 
like a pandemic. The goal is to build your economy in a way that not only limits the impact of the shock, but sets your economy up for a resilient recovery afterwards. So, um, so we say choose wisely, armchair economists. Next one, how to play. So we're going to put you into breakout rooms. We're going to, um, I think, organize you in maybe groups of four, uh, depending on how many people are here. You're going to nominate one person to share their screen in inside of your breakout room. Um, if you're able to do that, if you're having problems, please let us know because we can we can come into the room and 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 help you out. Um, it will rely on your you know your discussion and you know if you want to turn your camera on, that's up to you. But it will rely on you know either talking in the chat or talking um, through the audio. You're going to input your team username and your group's uh, a group member's email address. Just make sure you remember your credentials because you can actually go back and look at your past attempts. And you can do this game as many times as you want afterwards. It's there for you to, to utilize it as, as much as you want. So round one, the first thing you're going to do is choose your scenario, um, which is basically the, the circumstance by which your community is going to be um, developing its, its economy. There's four scenarios. You can either choose it or you can receive a random one. You choose your comparative advantage. Okay, depending on the circumstance that you choose, you will have a number of possible comparative advantages. There's eight built into the game. You can choose one of those. And then you select eight strategies, strategies to bring you know, your ideas into reality. So how do you take advantage of your comparative advantage? Um, there's 22 choices. This is where you're going to spend a lot of your time developing your, um, your strategies. So I will go through the game and I'll show you kind of what I'm talking about. There's eight options that you need to select. You can provide a rationale for your choices. If you don't have any time, that's okay. If you do, provide a little bit of um, information as to why you picked the ones that you did. Then you're gonna test your economy. You're gonna have a video come up. It'll tell you a little bit about what, what maybe happened to your economy and, and what of your strategies were eliminated and what of your strategies stuck around because they were good strategies in, it, you know, in regards to the shock that you ended up experiencing. And then round two, you get another shot to develop your, your strategies. Whatever strategies were eliminated, you get to go in and select some new strategies to hopefully build your resilience to come out of the shock. And then you're gonna review your final resilience and your overall sustainability score. There's 12 shocks built into the game. So depending on how you're, end strategy stacks up against all those 12 shocks um, that will determine what your overall sustainability score is moving forward okay and then remember your results and we'll have a little bit of a chat when we we come back a little bit of a debrief before jesse um presents his his material about the fntc okay next slide i guess i will share and i really hope i do not um freeze here Please bear with me. Okay. Okay, so this is the, if everyone can see my screen, this is what your, the game will look like. I will also share my sound. I wanna make sure I share my sound. Okay, and I'll just put my name in. If I can, I actually, my keyboard's not working at all. Oh. And then I say, let's play. Okay, it'll give you a little bit of background information, which, which is what I gave you. Then you can either select a random scenario or you can choose your scenario. I will say, select a random scenario. And this will be my scenario. I have a reserve, rural reserve community searching for an opportunity. Gives me a little bit of background on my community and gives you some hints as to um, your comparative advantage. Then we click let's see our comparative advantage. And you can select one of these advantages that you wanna build your economy around. Okay, so there's agriculture, tourism, commercial, resources and environment. Because of the scenario that I have, residential industry and technology are, are not feasible. So I can pick one of these other ones. I'm just gonna say commercial. 
And then here is where I think you're going to have most of your discussion. You have 22 strategies to pick from. If you hover your mouse over top of the strategy, it gives you more information about it. And so you can have a chat with your team members about what's best to implement in order to bring your comparative advantage to the forefront in, in order to develop your economy and set the foundation for your economy. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna pick eight really quick. The first eight, and we'll see how I do. And I hit enter. And then you'll see your economy. You have badges based on what your strategies were, depending on you know what your scenario was and also what comparative advantage you selected, you get a certain placemat. And here you can discuss wh why you've selected certain comparative advantages or you, sorry, your comparative advantage and why you selected certain strategies. If you're running out of time, don't worry about it. You can just hit test my economy. And this is where we get to see the shock. If my computer will allow me. Doesn't want to play the video. Okay, typically a video will play, here you go. I'm not sure if anyone could hear that, but I, I had shared my sound. I'm not sure if it worked, but so this is one of 12 shocks that occurred. I have my chief or tribal leader had abruptly resigned. And now I have some strategies that didn't last. I only got to keep one strategy of the ones that I selected. I got one out of eight. So I have to reselect my strategies. I need to pick seven more strategies to see if I can build resilience. This is the only one that would remain was my education and training strategy. The other ones just didn't work after my um, chief abruptly resigned. So I'm just gonna select um, a few more and see one, two, three. Oh, I can't select that one without selecting a different one, three. If you go too far, it says don't. And then I revive my economy. And then it gives me a little bit more information as to what had happened. It gives me my new resilience score. I didn't do too much better, two out of eight. And then it gives me my overall sustainability score. But inside here are a lot of lessons in regards to why certain strategies work and why certain strategies may be a little bit more of a challenge in regards to your resilience and your sustainability. Okay, so this is really your, um, this is the end of the game. You can either play again or go back to the Tulo Center. So that's just a quick kind of demo of how to play. And without further ado, I think we can put you into groups and give you, I think maybe 25 minutes would be probably about right for you to get into the game and, and we can jump into your breakout rooms and help you whenever, whenever you might have an issue. So Lindsay, how are we doing with breakout rooms? So you want 25 minutes, you said? Yes. Okay, we have three groups of four and we're ready to go. Perfect. So let us know if you need a hand. One of us will jump into your group and uh, help you out. Looks like some are still trying to join. Welcome back, everyone. If you're not cursing me, I, I'm wondering how you did and, and what you thought. So. Um, I'm going to go with 
group one and just um, Dolly, I think Dolly, Sandy and uh, Paul. So let me know how you did and, and sort of what your thoughts were about the game. If someone from your group wants to. Um, I found it really interesting. I was just telling the team there, sometimes we have to take a step back and, and look at that foundation rather than being eager, just sort of plowing ahead, which um, we tend to do. So yeah. I'm saying it's sort of a good reminder that, yeah, oh yeah, community support and <laughs> doing those, doing those uh, little things that are so important. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I think often, and we talked about this a little bit when I jumped in, it's meshing that, you know, that you got the business development and then you've got economic development. How do you allow businesses to work as opposed to going straight to business development and then maybe being subject to risks of shocks? Um, if you develop the economic foundation, those typically can withstand and the things like community support is a key. Um, those can typically withstand and allow you to become resilient, but Sometimes business, um, when you when you go into developing businesses, can be lucrative, can be very beneficial. Um, at times, you're subject to business risk. You're subject to the ebb and flow of the economy, and if there's an economic shock, you can you you can possibly be exposed. Um, group two, I think it was Ryan and uh, Tino. What? How'd you do? What'd you think? Um, I think we experienced the same same kind of thing. I think we went, uh, you know, kind of jumped into the whole, well, let's see if the business is viable and, and kind of missed some steps around how stable is the community, how much access does the community have to financing? Um, you know, I, I think maybe made the mistake of, of drawing on where we are in our own business world, I guess, in terms of business development and not thought about, well, this community may just be starting out. And, and that, so, you know, as was said by Dolly, the, the need for building that foundation, um, you know, to ensure that all those external risks are, are not jeopardizing um, development happening for the First Nation, so. Yeah, and Tina uh, had to come back to this group before I, I could press, um, submit for our last revision, but we went from two out of eight to six out of eight uh, with our revision, revised strategy. So that we definitely saw some learning there. Um, and as I spoke with Norm about, uh, about you know, adding some complexity to this is what are the resources for each one of these strategic options in the form of economic, environmental, and human? What's the cost associated with that? And what do we start with? And do we need contingency or do we have to use everything all up, um, at each decision point? This is a really, really cool tool. Fantastic. And I, yeah, to that point, we envision it being customized um, to, to support like strategies within specific communities. Um, we think that it could be a valuable tool in that regard. And we're all, we all have trade-offs, right? We can't do all everything all at once. So I think your point is a really good one in that aspect. We all have resource constraints um, and I think they're real. And they have to be implemented in the game, and I think that's the next iteration that we that we move to. Thanks, uh, Group Two. Um, last but not least, we got Patricia and um, and Tracy. How'd you do? Well, I want to say that we did well in terms of uh, thinking things through, and maybe we put too much into our thought process because we never did hit submit. So we don't know oh, how no. we did. We never oh, got no. there. Um, we we bounced around our number eight quite a bit, and then um, uh, we focused very heavily on the financial relationships, and then uh, we maxed out on our eight, and then we had to go back, and then we maxed out on our eight, and then we had to go back, and so we never we we don't know how we did. <laughs> oh no, we'll go back so, and try it again. Yeah, yeah, and so no idea. Oh. Maybe Tracy, if you're still on that website, you can hit submit and see what our end results are. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it now. Um, it had said that we had done, I can't remember what it, what the, the words were, but I'm just getting to looking at the video. So I'll look at it and, and or this, your sustainability score, one out of eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so there we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
and that's the challenge, right? It, I think uh, all the groups, um, and it, it might be kind of where you're at, right? Business development. Um, but again, a shock comes in, you don't know what the shock might be. It could, could really expose the, that business development to risk. So how do you ensure that you have sustainability in your economy, not necessarily in your business development, um, I think is the focus. And um, it, it seems like everyone picked up on that. So I'm, I really appreciate the comments. Um, I really appreciate the, you know, the enthusiasm of playing the game. And um, I've probably gone way over time here, but there's a video. Um, Chelsea put it in the, uh, in the chat there. Go on there and it talks a little bit more about that equation that I showed you and sort of the solutions for the game, um, sort of the, the philosophical underpinning of the game. So go on to YouTube and, and have a look at that video and, and I'm going to pass it along to Jesse here. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, we will we'll get right into it. Norm, I mentioned a, a, um, a couple of times, I think, the, the word jurisdiction. And, uh, I, I failed to start counting from the beginning there, but I, I heard it about, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, maybe 12 times <laughs> through your presentation. And uh, it, for those that have taken to a program, know that that's uh, one of the, the key words in the, at least the tax administration course. Um, so for those that uh, got on uh, after I introduced myself, I'm Jesse James. I'm the regional reach manager at, at the First Nations Tax Commission. I'm a member of Pegasus First Nation. I'm Ojibwe. Um, and my experience prior to joining FNTC was uh, working for First Nation uh, government uh, in BC for over 20 years. Uh, and you just experience a tool game. I think it's great. Uh, the you know, building a resilient economy starts uh, with community support as some of you got through it. Um, and uh, support from the community and leadership to implement your jurisdiction. Um, sometimes uh, implementing jurisdiction leads to uh, implementing fiscal powers, and that's uh, what we'll focus on today. Um, and this, pre like the presentation that we've got here for uh, the next few slides, is uh, going to you know describe some of the current fiscal options uh, relating to local revenue powers for First Nations. Uh, so next slide, um, yeah, we can go to the next slide after that. And I, next slide, Lindsay. Uh, again, just like you've seen in the uh, Tulu game, taxation is a fundamental government power, uh, enabling revenue generation without the reliance on other governments. Uh, it allows First Nations to set your own uh, policies, priorities uh, that are aligned with the community visions, aspirations, values. Uh, it can support economic development, by contributing to a community's infrastructure and services. And yeah, and there's, there's stable sources of revenue and um, yeah, basically just helping to, to, to start or to continue or maintain your community's economic development initiatives. Uh, on the next slide, we've got a, a bit of an illustration about the, uh, the property tax, uh, the snapshot of the 2020 year. Um, 190 First Nations um, across the country have established tax jurisdiction. Uh, some of them are, or most of them are in the FMA. Some are still uh, taxing under the Indian Act. And yeah, 118 are in the FMA, 34 in the Indian Act. Uh, and uh, of, if, of the total, you got 70% of the First Nations are RMBC. Uh, and you know, a shout out to some of our Saskatchewan uh, attendees here, you know, we see an uptake there, definitely an in interest in, in taxation in Saskatchewan, also Manitoba and Ontario. Yeah. On our next slide, we've got uh, at jurisdiction, uh, I've got it in caps here in my notes, uh, you know, mentioned so many times. So here's a, a picture of all the current available fiscal powers under the FMA for First Nations. So you got real property taxation, on the left, far left box, and that's essentially the the basic uh, taxation of interest and in reserve lands, uh, which would be like leases, permits, or occupations uh, of land and, and their improvements. Uh, right now, 104 out of in BC First Nations have this uh, power already. Uh, service taxes, just to say briefly on each one of them, service taxes are you know they're there to fund a specific fiscal infrastructure project. And oh, just a comment that 
I think that it might have been box uh, 12 or somewhere in there on the selection of 22. Uh, you know, expanded fiscal powers is one of them. This slide illustrates that it's the the the, the, box, the second to fifth boxes or, or second to sixth boxes illustrate what the expanded fiscal powers are. You have development cost charges or DCCs. Uh, those are charges to developers uh, for future infrastructure uh, requirements for to meet your long-term capital costs. Uh, business activity taxes or VATs. Uh, in BC, we have an accommodation tax uh, that's in place right now. Uh, and those are for developing properties such as uh, hotels. Uh, property transfer taxes. Uh, again, uh, this is gaining in popularity. Um, this is a tax on the transfer of a lease uh, that's triggered at the time of registration. And to support that, the First Nation must have an end management jurisdiction in place and you see in a couple of options in the game that would support that uh, and then lastly here you got service and facility fees and those are collected to uh, directly fund the cost of providing a specific service uh, to the taxpayers on, on the lands uh, and next slide steps to setting up your tax system you know whether you're considering uh, property taxation or you already have one in place and want to expand you know here's just a, a list you know being added to the FMA, uh, Tula Center training, we've gone through that earlier, uh, working with uh, the First Nations uh, Tax Commission tax advisor uh, to help develop uh, your, your framework uh, tax and assessment laws or, or the uh, expanded powers there. Law development support, next slide. So FNTC supports uh, in the First Nation uh, every step of the way as you're um, developing your laws. Uh, and um, just to note here, so depending on funding, some, some law development grants um, may be available to First Nations through application uh, when you're uh, you know, starting to work on your law. Uh, we would work th through uh, work plans, uh, assist you develop a work plan. Uh, we have samples and templates for, for that. We have samples and templates for, for laws, annual laws, um, and we can assist with the notification process as well. Um, next slide just talks about one other service I, I wanted to touch on a little bit today about service agreement facilitation. Uh, and you know, in, in the cases where First Nations are going through, say, the ATR process, or as you found in, in some options in the game, you're, you're close to municipality, and, and whether or not you want to build the infrastructure and deliver the services yourself, or just uh, you know, contract the uh, you know, the neighboring municipality on an as needed basis. You know, that's something that we assist uh, FMA First Nations with. And we've worked with a number of First Nations in BC, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba um, to implement uh, tax based service agreements. And just to uh, uh, highlight on the next slide, we got the resources. You know, you can go to the fntc.ca, uh, of course, Tulo Center. And the FNG, and just a little bit of, about the FNG, we've, uh, there's been an update there. It's, it's a faster website, it's more accessible. Uh, and right now there's over uh, 8,000 laws and bylaws located there. And it's generally First Nations that have you know, Section 81 or Section 83 land management, and of course, FMA laws. Um, you, you also would find fouls on there as well. And the last bit, uh, Shameless plug, like uh, mentioned earlier uh, in this particular one, we've got a couple of uh, upcoming workshops. And it's nice to see Saskatchewan, like I said, is represented. We've got uh, a workshop planned for uh, early 2022. We haven't uh, decided on a date yet for that, but that's going to be about property taxation. It will probably be about and, and, you know, 60 to 90 minutes of, of talking about the fiscal powers and the steps that, that uh, you know, a first issue go through. Uh, to get that done. Same thing in Ontario now, it's for November. Uh, that's that's about it. I, I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for listening. And if you want to hear more about the uh, you know, starting to become a, a taxing First Nation, then by all means, you can uh, contact us. Uh, if you're looking, if you're already taxing and you're looking to expand your fiscal powers, then again, you know, we're, we're here and available. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, 
if you know if you're interested in some of the capacity support that the FNTC provides in regards to you know implementing taxation service agreements, um, developing you know TLE ATR lands. Um, Jesse is definitely the one to to contact. His uh, maybe put your um, email address back up there, Jesse. If anyone wants to contact you in regards to even some information, they're there for you. That's what the FNTC is there for to provide capacity. Um, First Nation governments are are you know a lot smaller than than many other governments in Canada, and the FNTC is there you know cost free for First Nations to to get you know education, training, information, and to help to, uh, go through those processes. Um, with standards and sample laws and things like that. So he's the one to talk to in that regard. Um, any interest in the, um, you know, in the um, Tula Center of Indigenous Economics, you can contact uh, Chelsea, info at tulo.ca. And then my email is also norm at tulo.ca. If anyone wants to discuss, you know, educational programming, or if you have a question, or if you want to talk about the game, or how, you know, how we can redevelop the game to be a little bit more customizable. Love to hear your feedback um, and anything that you know you want to add um, as a result of this webinar. But I think we're completely out of time. Yeah, you can still access the game. Absolutely. App.tulo.ca. Go ahead, play it. It's yours. It's your tool. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, you know, play it, send me an email, get frustrated with me, scream at me. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> get upset about you know and maybe cheer i don't know i want to i want to hear your successes as well so um thank you everyone for being here today on a, you know on, on a wednesday and uh I, I really appreciate your you know your participation and your comments and i hope this this was useful to you and if you want to contact us we're always free to have a chat so thank you very much and i hope you have a really good rest of your week and uh really appreciate uh this uh, session that Innovate BC and CanDo was able were able to put on for us. Thank you.